Um, I'm going to get started in the meantime as well. So, Dan will join. So, thank you everyone for joining. Welcome. I'm excited to take you through the Alexa Form Builder. Uh, this is a new product we've rolled out in market. The session today is to uh, show you all the use cases, the capabilities. Uh, Laura and I will build some forms, so give you a good demo of the product. And we want this to be as interactive as possible. So please ask questions. In terms of the agenda for today, uh, we'll, we'll start off by going through the opportunity that Form Builder helps, you know, it, it provides to us and the, the sort of the things it solves for, for marketers. Uh, we'll go through some use cases and best practice as well, just to reiterate you know, about zero party data and then like how retailers should be rolling that out within their business. Laura and I will do a demo of the product. We'll jump into the platform and we'll show you how to build forms and also how the data is then flows into the CDP in the hub. And then we'll finish off with a slide on the roadmap. So show you what's coming next, um, how you can implement forms into your hub if you haven't already. And then we've got a link to resources at the end as well. So blogs, best practice guides, and some videos you can watch. So on the call today, you've got myself. Uh, my name's Guy. I'm originally from Sydney. Right now, I'm based in Los Angeles. Um, so I head up product marketing here at Lexa. Uh, also on the call, we'll have Christy, who many of you would have met. She's our senior VP of customer success. We've also got Laura as well, who heads up our product knowledge and support. Um, you may have seen Laura in our, in our uh, fundamentals guides and our best practice guides or even on the support channel. So glad to have you here today. In terms of quick housekeeping, this session's about 50 minutes, 45, 50 minutes. It is recorded and shared with everyone afterwards as well. And in terms of uh, questions, please use the QA function within Zoom for questions as you know throughout the session. Uh, we'll answer questions as they come up. So no need to wait for them to the end. Um, the way Zoom works, you are muted, but please use please use QA. All right, so the opportunity. So why Form Builder exists, essentially. Um, you know, we're all familiar with the term zero party data, but you know, we like to use the we like to say zero is a new hero when it comes to truly knowing your customers. And what we mean by that is. You know, zero party data is information your customers have shared with you. So, you know, most cases, this is things like surveys, quizzes, or feedback. The reason it's really important right now is the need for owned zero party data has quickly become like apparent, like a mandatory for retailers. So, as we know, cookies are on the way out, iOS privacy laws changes are, you know, changing quickly. Uh, you know, there's more options for customers or consumers to opt out of marketing. And so it's making it harder for retailers to target these people. And as you probably know, like buying third party lists is often very expensive and can lack accuracy. But the good news is that a study here from Accenture, 83% of customers are willing to share data with brands if it helps enable a more personalized experience. So the opportunity for this does exist. And that's why we're really excited to bring forms to you. So why, you know, why other form or survey tools fall short when compared to like a CDP powered form solution? You know, other survey tools you may have used in the past, they don't provide insight into your customers beforehand. So this insight allows you to then know something about your customers as a starting point, and that's going to inform the questions or the type of forms, or the type of surveys that you present to them. Um, you know, other survey tools don't allow you to create specific customer segments and then deliver that specific form to that segment at the right time, you know, right message, right time, right place. Um, so, you know, Alexa Forms allows you to do that. And these things results in sort of a one-size-fits-all spray and pray approach. So you might just create one form for all your customers, send it out. Hopefully they all, you know, as many people as possible submit that form. But then it's a one-size-fits-all approach and you don't know much more about them. Also, the post-survey analysis is limited. So because a lot of these, you know, surveys or other tools, you're not linking back the results to an individual person. 
And so that means that the results are often anonymous or in aggregate. So they're not tied to individuals, which lacks insight. Um, you know, so often these, these tools that you might've used in the past are you know, not connected to your data base or your systems. So anything you capture is in isolation and it's either, you know, it's hard to integrate then in, that into your channels for analysis, but also activation. So you know, often you might download a, a list of results and it sits on someone's desktop. It's not, it's not really, it's not best practice or it's not helpful for marketers either. Um, also, you're not able to then analyze the data alongside the customer's full history. So what else do we know about this customer that's going to add context to the results? It's really important. And so all these things together really impact your business decision making. And lastly, you know, the data you get from you know, other survey tools, they're not connected to your activation tools. So then you can't act on them really quickly. So you want to be able to capture the data and then act on it through Facebook or Google or email or SMS, whatever your activation channels are. Often those processes might be manual or require you to you know, go outside of your platforms. This, this is, increases time and effort. So, but the good news is Lexaforms makes all this easy. So Lexaforms is turning, in, turning surveys into actual insight that deliver personalization. And the way we do this is, you know, you can now target specific customers with the right questions every time. You get responses from real individual people. The results you're able to analyze alongside that customer's full customer history. So you know the full context or the full picture of, of the responses. You know, what are my high value customers saying versus my you know, one-time buyers who have lapsed? It's really important to sort of gauge responses based on who the customers are. You can do all this in one tool. So you can capture, unify, and enrich data all in one place. So it's you know, a one-stop shop and it's secure and easy to access. And then you know, best of all, you can quickly and easily act on these insights via the integrated channels you've already connected with Alexa. So your paid, social, your email, your SMS, et cetera. And then a bunch of automations built in as well, which will hopefully save you time and money. So next we're gonna to touch on a few use cases and best practice. I'm gonna hand over to Christy for this section. Oh, thanks Guy. Um, so yeah, let's talk about some use cases for the use of forms and collecting zero party data. Um, so when you consider the hundreds of different customer touch points um, that your customers engage with on a day-to-day -day basis, the use cases for zero party data capture are really extensive. And they range from using forms to fill any gaps that you have in your customer data, especially things like date of birth. And we're seeing lots of clients use forms to help them better understand their customer personas. Um, they can also be used to deliver automated welcome journeys that will help you better understand why a customer has purchased, which allows you to personalize future communications to those customers. And while post-purchase NPS is a stablemate for every retailer, uh, mapping a customer's NPS to their transactional profile in the CDP really helps you to understand broader trends across the customer experience and to make really meaningful changes to that experience for greater customer satisfaction. And there's some really great use cases for security, including uh, across customer verification and for GDPR purposes. On the next slide, uh, when you map those use cases across the customer journey, you'll see that there really is a form for any type of scenario. Um, and in some cases, you can build one form that has uh, multiple uses. So for example, you could build a competition form that you might use for lead generation activities, but you could also use that same form in order to encourage a customer to repurchase if they haven't purchased with you for some time. Um, We'll share some resources at the end of the presentation, but um, we have some further information which we will share after this session that you can also access on our website. Um, and then on the next slide, it includes some really great best practices when starting out with forms. Um, so with that, I think we'll get into the demo. Thanks, Christy. Yep, so there's links to these resources at the end of the deck, so you'll be able to, uh, you'll be able to grab those after the session today. Now, in terms of the demo, we're going to focus on three form examples, and we think these are good, good examples that sort of across, like Christy said, across the customer lifecycle. So we're going to start off with a lead gen acquisition form, so like a competition entry. We're going to look at a customer survey, 
And then we're going to finish on a post-purchase feedback survey, including MPS. So you we, like these are forms that a lot of you are already using. Um, these fall into our best practice guide. We think these are really good examples of, of the form builder in action. So I am going to share my screen, jump into the hub. Cool. So now I'm, now I'm in Lexa. Um, to, to launch forms, if you haven't launched forms already, it's you can launch it via the manage menu. So you can do that via the menu at the top or this panel down here. And you'll notice forms is, is in the subhead. So we're no longer to forms. Um, if you haven't yet uh, implemented forms, there'll be a call to action here. Um, so we've already, you know, this is our demo hub fitness co, our fitness retailer. So we've already built some forms. You can see those on the left here that we can then edit. Um, or in your case, you'll see most likely create new form. I'm going to start with the lead gen competition. And this is one I've already built. So lead gen competition entry. I'm going to start with looking at the form. Um, here it is here. So it's a nice bright pink and white one. Uh, this is an example of what you could use at, for your lead gen. So you would use this on maybe, for example, paid social. So you would run a competition. You would uh, create a lookalike of your best customers to then use in Facebook or Google or Instagram or TikTok, and then present them with a competition to go into the drawer, in this case, to win $1,000 worth of fitness, fitness gear. And this is a really simple form. Um, three, three questions, email, first name, and favorite workout with a terms and conditions tick box at the end. And um, I'm going to show you now how to build this form in the form builder. So we start off with the, the title. So win a fitness bundle worth $1,000. You just type that in. I've chosen then to add a sub head down here. Enter your details below to go into the draw to win. So that's the first block. It's a text blocks. Um, you can see all the blocks listed down the right-hand side here. We then have the first question, which is email. Um, this is what we're using as the linkage. So um, one thing to keep in mind is all these blocks, so text blocks, email, I'll, I'll show you the other 20 or so blocks we have in, in a second. But each of these blocks, they, they automatically have like built-in validation to the type of data that that block would expect to receive as part of that question. So in this case, we're using the email block. That means that when a customer or a prospect adds information to that block, it's looking for an email address and it's going to only accept things that qualify as an email address. It also means that when we pull that data into the CDP, it's automatically formatted as an email attribute. And that's the same for first name, last name, and you know, phone number, postcode, et cetera. So while on the surface, they all look similar within the form to the customer, there's actually built-in logic behind each block type that translates that into an attribute. I've got first name here. What's your first name? I've added a nice description underneath, nice to meet you. You know, it's, it's, if we want each of these blocks to be a required field, you simply just tick or untick the box. In this case, it's been requir required. Um, you'll notice that as I did that, the form up here last saved just now. So as you go through the forms and it make changes, it'll automatically save for you. So your work will be saved as you go. Um, but once you're then happy with your form, you then need to publish the form for those save changes to then go live. And then you'll notice your nice green live indicator over on the left. This has a multiple choice question. Um, because we're a fitness brand, you know, we've, this is the first interaction we've had with these people. And we're going to ask a really simple question, something like, what's your favorite workout? And what that allows us to do is then capture these people into our database and then be able to personalize to them from day one. So we can simply just create a multiple choice drop down list here. What's your favorite workout? Please choose one. We've got our options here, swimming, running, yoga, Pilates, et cetera. Um, we can also, you also notice here include other options. So by ticking or unticking that box, the customer will then be presented with another. So in some cases, you know what the list is going to be. In some cases like workout, there might be other ones you haven't considered. So instead of making a list super long, you can simply add another box at the bottom 
if they click that, it then presents them with a little field and they can add in their, their other activity. In this case, it might be cricket or something similar like that. So a lot of these like multiple choice lists or drop down lists um, have an, another option built in. All you simply do is tick that box. If we were to then change any of these uh, options, you just come in here and retype the option or you hit X to remove that option from the drop down list as well. So really easy, really intuitive. Um, again, you can just click re required if necessary. And then lastly, you know, to help with you know, legal teams and keeping them happy, we can add something like, you know, I agree to the terms and conditions by ticking a box. So we've got a checkbox option um, and then customers can simply just tick that box and then that creates that as an attribute. And so we know that they've opted into the terms and you know want to receive marketing from us if we were to add more to this more to this uh form we simply just hit add block down here we're presented with all the different choices we have there's over 20 different options you can add to your forms the most common ones will display up the top for you as you use them things like multiple choice first name last name dates nps which will show you on the next example um, text, you know, scale, like, you know, rate us out of 10, give us a ranking, give us a star rating, lots of different options here you can use. Uh, we'll continue to build out these options as more use cases come to light. I think these are really good starting points for the, for the use cases, you know, you have today. So if I was to add a drop down option, I select that, it adds it to the bottom of my form. We then um, give it a a name, so it might be, you know, workouts per week. We may want to know how how often do they work out per week, and it could be you just add options as you go once, twice, you know, I'm just going to say multiple. Um, so that then you go into design, and we can see that option has been added down the bottom here: workouts per week, once, twice, multiple. So you can kind of Test your work as you go. Jump back into jump back into build. Make edits. Jump back into design. See how it looks. Really easy to use. Um, while we're in the design panel, I'm just going to show you over here on the right hand side the different design options we have. So you can easily and quickly change the font. There's hundreds of fonts in here, like web safe fonts to pick from. So I feel like everyone would have something for their brand. You can change the alignment of the text. Left the line centered really quick and easy. Uh, you can change the, the colors of the titles. So this is the text. So we can change, you know, our headlines to be red, our descriptions to be black, for example, really quick and easy. You can choose from hex RGB, so you can actually put your brand um, colors in here, so it matches exactly. The button text, you know, and the button brand color. So, you know, this is a nice pink example here. You can just choose from the color picker again, and that changes the colors of the buttons. You can choose a background color. Um, in this example, I've actually chosen a background image. So you can just upload a JPEG or a PNG via the upload button. You just select that from your desktop. And then I dropped in this fitness background example here. So really quick and easy to make the branding on point for your brand. The advanced tab actually lets you to add CSS, custom CSS to your form. So you can even take this further and further and make it fully customized. Um, so you can do that via that panel. Anything else on the design that's interesting? Oh, while I'm here in the settings. So now we've got our questions and our design looking good. We can go into the settings tab. And this is where you can change the form name. That's the name that appears within your list on the left. That's the internal name. Um, you can also add links uh, for the privacy policy or terms and conditions that exist at the bottom of the form. So we know those are kind of must have for most brands these days. So here I've, you can change the text, like what the actual link will say and where it will link to. Um, so this could link off to your privacy policy page. Um, you can change this. It might say terms and conditions, for example you know, competition, um, the permissions. So these are the different groups within your Alexa hub who have access to this form. So for larger teams, you may want to segment form access based on department. 
And then finally, the metadata. This is the this is the the text that displays like when you share the form. What displays up in the so here the tab, the name of the tab, the title of the tab, and also you can change like the the icon and the preview image as well. You can upload images here. So lots to customize. You could also archive and delete forms from here as well. So that just helps you make your list nice and clean. Um, one thing with archiving and deleting, if you've captured data on a form that's already been pulled into the CDP, then that data exists. Even if you delete the form, you've already enriched those customer profiles with data. So that information won't go anywhere. It's just more the actual form itself is then archived or deleted. Um, one last thing before I hand off to Laura. So you'll notice here the page, like the pages down the right hand side. So sort of this allows you to uh, change the pagination. So this form is is one single one single view. Everything's on one page because it's a short form. For maybe longer ones, which Laura will show you, like a customer survey or a feedback survey, you may want to break it down into multiple pages, maybe something like a type form example. And so you can do that just by hitting the X of the cross here, and you then can add more pages to your list and then just simply drag and drop the questions onto an additional page. So now we've got two pages. We've got three or four questions on the first slide, two on the second, and that just makes it a bit more like of a you know, step process. Um, you notice here there's a thank you page as well. So that's what displays once the form has been submitted. You can change the text or the, the imagery or the wording on the thank you page um, once the submit button has been pressed. Um, and I think that's everything for the lead gen example. Um, Laura, do you want to take us through the next one, which I believe is a survey? Yeah, welcome survey. Thanks, guys. So I am going to share my screen with you all. There we go. Now, can you see the screen? Yes. Looks Perfect. Good. Okay, so I'm going to be building out a welcome survey. So these are really great to get to know your customers and you can start to add them to segments and personalize to them from day one. These types of surveys are also really great to incentivize to encourage people to fill them in. So um, promo codes or discount codes, for example, to help drive that first sale. So to get started on the bottom left here, I'm going to select create new form and I'm going to just chuck it in a form name. So I'm just going to call this welcome survey and this is internal facing only. Um, this is not what your customers are going to see. Then I hit create form and you'll see it's in draft on the side or in the side panel here. Um, when you create a new form, you're automatically, you sort of automatically start with two pages. So page one here, and then your thank you page. And these are templated for you um, right off the bat, but you can make changes to them as needed. As you get started with your form and start to make changes, it's going to auto save. So this is up in the corner here. Um, so you don't need to save manually. It'll save as you go along. Anytime you want to preview your form, just hit the preview button at the top. And then when you're ready to publish, we've got our big teal publish button as well. But um, I'll go into these in a little bit more detail later. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start by building out the form and adding all of our questions. And let's, then we'll touch on structure, design, previewing, and publishing. Now, because this is our welcome survey, I'm just going to change the title here. Go and uh, I'll add in a little bit of a description text. So I mentioned that these are really good to incentivize. So let's chuck that up front. So um, tell us a little bit more about yourself and be rewarded with 15% off your first order. The email uh, question comes next. And again, that's templated because it's always best practice to have email in and this is how we do linkage uh, in the Lexa Hub. But the first question block I'm going to add is going to be a uh, birthday. So I'm going to select a date question. And I'm just going to pop in, what is your birthday? And as a best practice, it's always best to ask for birthday rather than date of birth. Date of birth sounds very formal. People can be a bit suspicious as to why you're asking, but birthday is a lot more fun. Um, I think as well, your customers 
also expect a little treat on their birthday. So add that into the description, give them a reason why you're asking uh, this question. Uh, so uh, what do we look at? Treat on your birthday. There we go. So we've got our description there. Now you can also change the date format, um, how you want it to display. So we've got it set uh, for day, month, year, but if you've got American customers, for example, you could flip that and change it to month, date, year. Um, so you've got the option to customize that how you want. I'm gonna make this question required as well. Now I'm gonna add my next block and this is gonna be all about preferences. So I'm going to choose uh, check boxes for this, and we're going to ask our quest, uh, our customers, uh, what you want to hear about. Uh, so this means that we can pers again personalize to them from day one once we know their preferences. So because we're a fitness brand, maybe they want to hear more about uh, fitness tips or uh, product features, for example. Uh, we might have sales and promos and events. Okay, and uh, we'll make this one required as well. But the really great thing about questions like this is that once you start to get answers in, you can segment your customers based on their choices and then start to send them comms that are relevant to their uh, interests. And I'm gonna add our final block here and I'm gonna make this one multiple choice, I think. Uh, and we're going to ask, how did you hear about us? Again, this one's really important because you wanna understand how your customers are, are coming in, which of your acquisition channels are working. So let's go Instagram, uh, TikTok and Google. And let's also include other as an option uh, so they can put in a custom answer as well, as well. Maybe they walk past a store and that's how they heard about us or they heard um, a great review from a friend or something like that. And I'll make this question required as well. So finally, I'm going to make some changes to our uh, thank you page. Now, right up front, we mentioned uh, a discount code. And so this is where I'm going to add that uh, discount code in. Um, use promo code THANKS. And so this is how they'll finish off their survey. This is what they'll see. And then hopefully from completing the survey, you'll see them use this promo code pretty soon afterwards. Now, let's get back to the, looking back to the start of our survey. We've popped all our questions in, but what about structure? So right now you can see that I've added um, all of the question, all of our questions to the same page. But um, as Guy went through, it's really easy to drag and drop and move things around. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add um, a new page because maybe I want the first page of my survey to be all about asking those uh, personal questions, so email and birthday. And maybe our second page is going to be more about their preferences and uh, what channel they came in from. So I'm going to drag and drop those questions down. And now we've got uh, a two page survey and you can see that uh, reflected in these little pagination bars down the bottom here. So there was one before and now we've got two um, and page one is highlighted, meaning that I'm on page one. Uh, and staying in the design tab, now we can make all of our changes to make our form as jazzy as possible. So we can choose a font, we can change our text alignment, so, uh, sorry, title alignment. So maybe I wanna go center aligned and we'll make our text center aligned too. We can change the um, color of our titles. Uh, green is my favorite color. So why don't we do a little green situation? Um, so we'll make our titles green, that's very bright. I'll keep our description text as black, but again, you can change this to whatever you want. Uh, button text, I'll keep as white, and we can add our brand colors in as well. So this is, um, as Guy mentioned, what color your buttons, the pagination uh, bars, things like your checkboxes are going to look like, and a background color as well. Uh, the default is the gray, but again, you can choose whatever you want. I'm going to keep it as gray because I feel like anything else is going to clash with the green we've got going on here. Um, but if I wanted to add a background image, 
um, I could add that into. Uh, so once you've added all your questions, you've done your design and you're really happy with the way your form is looking and feeling, you can preview it. So I'm gonna click on the preview button and give it a little view. And one thing I really, I wanna call out here is that when you're in preview mode, you'll have this big preview uh, mode disclaimer at the top. This means that you can click to your heart's content. You can add as many questions as you want, click submit. And this isn't, none of these uh, sort of dummy responses are gonna be pulled into the CDP. So it really is best practice to do all of your testing in preview mode and just make sure that big disclaimer is up there when you do so because no responses are going to be captured and your data isn't going to contain any dummy data in the CDP. But once you've previewed, it's all looking good. This is when we can move on to publishing. So I just click the publish button at the top and you can either get a share link, which you can share with, um, with your customers. So you might want to put that in an email or you've got your embed code. So um, you can add that directly into your web, uh, website in an iframe or something like that. But let me view uh, our live form now. And you can see immediately that the preview disclaimer is gone, which means that any uh, inputs now are gonna be pulled into the CDP. So again, just make sure when you're testing, you're not using a live form because you don't want your dummy data um, mixing with your real customer data. But I think that's kind of covered uh, everything with the form. I guess the one final thing I'll say is once it's live, you'll see that it's gone from draft to live in the side panel here. Um, so yeah, that's our welcome survey and Guy, I'll throw back to you. Thanks, Laura. Awesome. All right, okay. Now I'm gonna jump in and show an example, our third example, which is the post-purchase survey. So this is a great one for retailers or any any, any brand is wanting to know more about the customer experience. So I'm going to build a new form here. So create new form. Uh, we're going to call this, uh, this is our post purchase. So that's added to our list. Um, okay, now let's get started building the page. So this is something that we want to, you know, in most cases automate to send, you know, uh, you know, seven days after order. And you can, the beauty of having these forms connected to the CDP, we have all the order data. So we know when a customer ordered, we know what they bought, we know who they are. So we can then trigger a segment to, to send the post-purchase survey seven days after order or 10 days, whatever you, th you think is that sweet spot. It's usually between seven to 10 um, to, to then automatically pull in satisfaction and feedback from a customer that we can then look at compared to their order, their spend, their average order value, and, and get the full picture of those people. So tell us about your recent experience. I'm just gonna drop in a subhead as well. Thanks for shopping with us. We'd love to hear more about your experience. And then you know, most in most cases, the first question he's gonna ask is, is MPS? Um, so we have an MPS block. Um, we also have a scale as well. They are different. Like on the surface, they'll look similar, but MPS is actually, you know, pulling in that data and calculating in MPS for you, which I'll show you in the hub after this, which is really important. So now you've got to capture MPS, but also then convert those numbers, the zero to 10, into an actual MPS score. And Lex will do that. So how likely are you to recommend us? You can change this text if you like. We're going to make that required. So that's going to give us a MPS scale rating buttons. Um, you know, because we're a fashion retailer, you may want to understand things around customers fit, which is really important. So for that, we're going to choose multiple choice. You know, we see a lot of returns, you know, for e-commerce brands and fit is often, uh, you know, one of the most important things to customers. So we can just start to understand, you know, was the fit smaller than expected, you know, true to size or, you know, for example, larger. And so let's make that required scan. These are really, you know, let's learn about this now before it be, they become returns and then use that data to then for future campaigns as well. Uh, we can add, you know, another option. You know, it could be a checkbox, for example. So the beauty of, you know, multiple choice versus checkbox, checkbox, they can choose multiple. So, you know, what in this example, it might be what matters most when you make a purchase. 
and they might be able to select multiple options. So, you know, are people price price sensitive? Are they purchasing based on color? Um, is it about fit for them? Is it about style, or it could be other? And you know, the the beauty of these ones is, you know, this option they can only select one, so it has to be smaller or larger or true to size. But then in what are their motivations? They might have two motivations. I might be a, a color and fit person or, or, or price. Um, so different options for, for different questions. The, the, next op, the next one I'm going to show you is an example of the conditional logic. So what that means is the answer to one question can then either present the customer with a, with a different next question. And so I know a lot of you you know, want to use these in your surveys. So I'm going to start off with a, with a block. Um, and that would be an example of this might be, would you shop with us again? And the answers are either yes or no. Hopefully everyone says yes. But for the people who say no, we want to know why. So now let's add the follow-up question first. So I'm going to add a block. In this case, I'm going to choose short text. That gives us a text block where they can enter a response. And you know, we can say, if no, why? Tell us why. Now we're going to hit the validation and logic button here. And we're going to add a rule. You choose the first question. So would you shop with us again? Then you create a rule to say, is no. So would you shop with us again? If the answer is no, then show this question, the question I'm currently on. Uh, now we click back into the form to test this. We just simply go into design and see our form. Would you shop with us again? If I click yes, happy days, they can, they could submit the form. If they click no, then it pops the additional block. If no, why? And I can enter in the, uh, you know, the response there. So really good. So it may just be a simple, you know, if this if this answer showed this question, it could then actually take them to a different section of the, the form as well. If it's, if it's more complex, like you could want to skip a, a bunch of questions in, in that case. But here's a really simple example of, of, of how it can be used. Um, again, think about the, the thank you page. Um, this is a draft. So I could then navigate away from this page, go do something else, come back. This will still be saved as a draft for me until, until I'm happy with it. Like Laurie did publish the form, then I get the sharing options. But right now this is in preview mode. Um, and that's, that's, that's a good example of a post-purchase form. This is one of our you know, must-have forms in our guide, in our best practice guide, something you want to set up for your customers as like kind of always on. And then make sure you're capturing NPS and feedback from your customers on a regular basis. Um, you know, now let's jump into the hub and I'll show you how it looks. Um, the data starts to pull into the hub. So now we're in our understand segment view, which you're familiar with. Um, I've already built a segment for this. So I'm going to pull up our fitness comp entries. So these are people who have entered the first form I showed you, which was the lead gen capture form. So like capturing people's email addresses and first names and their fitness uh, favorite workout. Uh, the way that you build the segment to pull in the specific answers to a specific form is once you've built your form, you'll notice in the URL, there's, a, there's an ID between the forward slashes. So you just copy this. ID, so in this case, it's A, D, B, 7, F, 3, et cetera. You go into understand, you pull up the survey attribute, it's called submitted survey. And then you simply just copy that ID into that field and you hit run. And this will pull in anyone who submitted that survey. So that, that's what I did. And then I saved that as a segment called fitness comp entries. And this segment is then unique to this form, people who have filled out that form. So you can have as many you know, forms as you like in market. There's no, there's no limit to the amount of forms you can create. And then what you wanna do is create a segment per form, entitle that correctly, 
and then you know exactly who has come through which form. And if I click on the profiles, I can see these six people. Uh, there's me. Hit the attributes, you start to see my email, my first name, and my answers to the form. Also, you'll start to see some answers to other forms in here as well. So, you know, I filled out this form and said I my favorite workout was swimming. Um, and I've agreed to the terms and conditions. You can see that there. I've also filled out some other forms so you can start to learn more about me from other places too. And this is all then unified against my individual profile. Based on your, also your form responses, you'll automatically be added to other segments too that you've already built based on criteria. So I, because I've picked swimming, I should be in the swimming segment here, like the swimming persona. And that means that, so like Laura said, based on these welcome surveys, then my welcome experience should be based around swimming. Maybe it's the creative, the copy, or the products that you that present. Um, versus Laura's might be cycling. So she gets the cycling products and the cycling creative um, and so on. Um, okay, back to attributes. One thing I didn't mention originally was the um, first name. So the reason uh, Lexa, most of you would already know this, but Lexa has the inferred gender attribute where we can infer someone's gender based on first name alone. And this is a really good starting point for some, some simple segmentation for gender or, or even just for the types of products or creative that's, that's relevant. Um, so just by capturing a customer's first name, um, you can then start to put them in, into these segments from day one without having to ask additional questions. And that might just help, you know, make the content you create a bit more relevant. Uh, I'm going to show an example here. This is another one. This is Kyle, who's filled out uh, the lead gen survey. You can see he, he, his inferred gender is male, just based on his first name being Kyle. So you already know more about him just from that simple, simple segment. The next thing I'm going to show you, I spoke about MPS before, so MPS is really important. Um, you know, as you start to capture that MPS feedback from the surveys, um, obviously the score is important. So what people have, have, have said and also the feedback, you actually want to turn that, that MPS number into the actual calculation as well, because that's what a lot of businesses use to report you know, um, you know, customer satisfaction month on month or, or quarter on quarter. So I've pulled up the NPS feedback segment and that's being powered by our net promoter score attribute, which has been captured from the form. And if I scroll down here to uh, net promoter score attribute, we can then dive into that, those responses. So we have 13 profiles who have submitted an NPS, which is great. Uh, we've got the average score of 8.3, so that's the out of 10. Um, but as you know, NPS is a completely different calculation. But what Lexa is doing is actually providing you that calculation here. So six, your NPS score for these for this result is 62. Um, so that's what you'd actually use in your, you know, your broad reporting, your quarterly reports. So 62 is actually really good. I think anything over 50 is, is, is excellent. So the brand's doing well. And Lexa will then maintain or automatically update that net promoter score for you based on the net promoter MPS block in the forms. So that's really important, really useful. And then you can add that to your track dashboards as well to track MPS score over time as well, which is really interesting. Um, you can then, like I said, use the comparison tool to then start to understand, okay, what are the survey attributes compared to existing attributes I have on customers? So, you know, it could be something like gender. So understanding NPS based on gender or satisfaction based on spend, um, you know, based on location, based on channel. So are my e-commerce customers more satisfied than my store customers or vice versa? So you can do that using the comparison. You can compare any two attributes in relation to each other. Um, so inferred gender, we only have one person in this segment with inferred gender because it's a demo hub. Um, but you know, 
Um, an example is in this hub, we've actually got our CEO, David Chin. Um, he's filled out some, some surveys previously for this for this ski brand. Um, he's also made some purchases as well. So his, his average order value is $498, which is great. We know a lot about him based on his interactions with the brand, but now we can also know more about him from surveys too. So he's he skis two times a season. He's also like cycling. So this is really important for you know active brands. What else do they engage with? Um, what other content do you like? Um, you know, how does he get to the snow while he flies? Um, he's most interested in fit. So then we can sort of cross-reference these things with his spend or what products he's buying or how much he's worth to really understand, you know, what's most important to our high value customers and how do we then better serve them. Create some personas, like there's really lots of different ways you can do it. So that's how the data comes into the hub. And then I guess jumping back into the, the deck, um, so I'm sort of on time now, but in terms of roadmap, you know, very shortly this week, we'll have the summary tab appearing in the forms product. So that'll allow you to track the number of uh, submissions you have in total, but also put per form as well. There's also an option to download results to a CSV as well, which is, which is handy for some people. Um, and then what the team's working on next is we're going to start rolling out our forms capability to our other products as well, like so customer service and serve. So what that allows us to do is then use the, you know, the, the form builder to power those uh, forms you might use as part of you know your respond um, and and your other touch points that you use through Alexa, and also the ability to link forms to specific customers as well without the need for that email block, and then you know you may able to use link other linkage like a mobile mobile uh, mobile number or an ID. And then in the future, we're always listening. So please, as you have more use cases and feedback, please let us know, because that's how we make our product better. Here's an example of the summary tab. Uh, it's, it's really simple. It will show the volume of, of submissions over time for each of your forms. So that'll be available at the end of this week. And then finally, in terms of implementation, so those that don't yet have uh, forms in their hub, it's uh, really easy to get this turned on. So. In terms of access, you know, the access, the license for forms is only $500 per quarter. And so what that allows you to do is then get access to the forms tool. But in addition, just that access, you also get a thousand free submissions every quarter. So a thousand free form submissions um, across any number of forms, and that's included with your license fee. Um, also included in that license fee is all the data enrichment and attributes and validation and logic that comes with it. So all the blocks I showed you before, all the design features, um, the conditional logic, all the features that you saw in the demo today are available for all customers. Uh, in addition to that, we have our best practice guides, we have playbooks and support as well included in that, in that price. And then in terms of the actual usage of your forms, so there's a rate card, which then comes into play. And anything above the first 1,000 is then calculated as per the rate card. And you can see here, as you, as you capture more submissions to your forms, the cost per submission goes down. And that's something that is then calculated every quarter, ta tallied, and then invoiced. And then you start fresh again for the next quarter with your 1,000 free submissions again. Um, and so you better track your your usage as per the summary tab, which I showed you earlier. Um, and then to get access to forms, please please uh, reach out to either success manager or the support our support team, and they'll give you what you need to be able to then turn on forms in your hub. Once it's in your hub, you then navigate to manage, and it's available under the forms menu. And then lastly, let's finish off with some resources. So as Christy and Laura mentioned before, we have a number of resources. We've got several blogs which talk about best practice and zero-party data and how brands should be using it. We have our learn documentation, which goes through you know, setting up guides and also some best practice in terms of thinking about the types of things you, you know, want to capture from forms and how the data will be used. 
And then we have some previous webinars, which the success team rang, rang, ran. So zero party best practice, which Chris and the team did last year. You can watch those videos. And we also have a really basic pricing calculator, which you know, might give you some um, an idea of based on volume of submissions, what the sort of rate card looks like for you. So we'll share this video, we'll share these links. That should be everything you need to be able to confidently start using forms. That brings us to the end. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, Christy or Laura, I don't know if there's any questions or comments that came through. Doesn't look like it. No? Okay. Well, if anyone has any questions, please reach out. I'm more than happy to help. Um, talk to your success manager or use our uh, support live chat. Um, and for everything else, <clears throat> sorry, everything else, we'll leave it there today. And thank you for joining. Have a good day. Bye. Thanks, Laura. Bye.